And a very good morning to you. I'm Erica von Amarva, and this is a special post-budget broadcast, which Summit is hosting with private client wealth management company Citadel. Now, you've no doubt watched aspects of the national budget. We are taking it a step further this morning by establishing what it means for your pockets and your investments. Our guest, Kuben Naidu, who is head of the Secretariat to the National Planning Commission. Dave Moore, Citadel's Chief Investment Strategist, and Madeleine Schubert, Citadel's Tax and Fiduciary Specialist. Welcome. Really lovely to have you here. Thank you. And we want you as viewers to participate, so please do send us your questions. You can SMS the word SUMMIT and your question to 34814. And remember, SMSs are charged at a cost of a rand 50. So, Dave, let me begin with you as, as the economist and, and the strategist. Uh, and I think a, a greater than expected reduction in the overall deficit for the current fiscal year and the new fiscal year. Is it smoke and mirrors? How did the minister achieve this? Well, first of all, I mean, we must realize that he had a very tough job. I mean, against the background of slower growth internationally, slower growth locally, as his um, numbers showed as well, um, I think he did well because there was no fiscal space for him to actually support the economy. I mean, they used up uh, what we call the fiscal space, the bigger budget deficit already three years ago as the world went into an economic recession. So he was faced with, with very tough circumstances. I think under the circumstances, budgeting for a smaller budget deficit is, is a very good achievement. However, one's got to look into the numbers to see how achievable that is. Um, and there are areas within government spending where there's a lot of pressure um, and that pressure is still coming through. Um, he is budgeting that that pressure is going to disappear. And here we're talking about increases in the wage bill that we've seen tremendous increases over the last four, five, six years. Um, so the credibility of this budget is going to depend very much on whether he can achieve the shift from current spending, which a large part of that is salaries and wages and interest paid and uh, social subsidies and those things or social grants, can, can achieve that shift uh, towards capital spending. But all in all, I think mm. uh, still a good budget, um, but again, uh, it's going to be tough to stick to that budget over time. Kuben, Dave referred to the pressure on the Minister, and I, I'm sure you more than anyone at the National Planning Commission know about the pressure of these long-term ambitions that we have for the country. And, and these budgets are just incremental steps in that r direction. Are we moving in the right direction? I think we're moving in the right direction. It's important to understand the context within which we're in. Uh, as Dave pointed out, the world economy is not a happy place. Uh, we've done relatively well because of our past good performance on the fiscal side. We are in a recovery mode. It's a relatively slow recovery because of the global economy. But yes, we're moving in the right direction. You know, I think that the budget is broadly supportive of growth, both because the deficit is lower, but also because there is higher infrastructure spending. Um, but yes, it's going to be a long climb out of, of, of the 2008-9 recession. Well, Minister Gordon referred to the details of our deficit and indeed also the implications for the debt uh, yesterday. Let's see how he worded that. South Africa's finances are in good health. A budget deficit of 4.6% of GDP is projected in 2012-2013. We plan to reduce the deficit to 3% of GDP in 2014-15. And the public debt will stabilize at about 38% of GDP. Now, Madeleine, part of the reason why our deficit in the current fiscal year is looking better than planned in October is the fact that we uh, managed to get in more taxes than planned on the corporate side and on the VAT side. Mm. Yes, I mean, that obviously means that companies have improved their sales and their profits has gone up, which I uh, guess um, is an indication that um, growth is happening and profits are up. And it's probably also an indication why we start looking at tax hikes to, to keep on upping those coffers for government. And your views on the ability of, of individuals, where, whether it's individuals or corporates, to handle a higher tax burden? And we'll talk about the details of the, the changes in the tax rates, but longer term this all has to be funded. That's correct. I don't know if it's necessarily a good idea. Um, Dave can probably give us an input from a, from a growth perspective. But uh, I think the time has ar arised that more taxes need to be collected to obviously fund all this expenditure that, that needs to be done. And we've been so lucky after the, for the last few years to, um, 
to have these tax cuts done for us. But I think it's globally and everywhere else we need to collect taxes. And I think time has come for us to pay, unfortunately, because yes. um, it affects everybody's own pocket. If we look at the Business Days coverage on the front page today, they, they ran the story on this surprise on the, uh, the lower deficit and uh, pointing out it's silencing the skeptics, amongst others, the ratings agencies, Dave. Yes, I think uh, if we look at the rating agencies, of course, their credibility is, is not what it used to be. Uh, but certainly, if you look at financial markets, they're very intolerant of large deficits these days. Therefore, it was very important, I think, for the minister to illustrate the intention of reducing the deficit over time. Uh, two numbers that are favorable in terms of, of international deficit numbers. If you look at our overall debt, uh, government debt to GDP ratio, that's still low. But we must remember that's low because of a long period of fiscal consolidation that we've had. You know, we made a lot of progress from the mid-90s up till the mid-2000s in terms of our fiscal yeah. situation. And to be honest, we've almost doubled in a, in a short space of time. We, we've gone up a lot. But I mean, the, the lesson is that in the good times, you need to consolidate your fiscal situation so that in tough times like this, you've got the leeway to do this. And it's amazing. I mean, we talk about tax increases here and there. There's the capital gains uh, rate that effectively is increased. But overall, there, there hasn't been a, a real tax increase on the economy as a whole from this budget or any budget over the last little while, so we're still which, which is a major pretty, achievement, yeah. I think, that we've seen. So perhaps you, you don't uh, quite agree with what the Times has said there, a headline, it's a Robin Hood budget, taking away from the rich and giving to the poor. Um, provocative, perhaps, uh, Guben, your view on that, given, given your ambitions to reduce poverty and inequality? I think it's a fair budget. I think that on balance, on average, in aggregate, there is a reduction in the overall tax burden on the economy, a small reduction, 2.3 billion. Um, but yes, the, the tax cuts are largely focused at the bottom end of the, of the income spectrum, and I think that that's a good thing. Mm. The Citizen and the Star took the story of the toll issue, and I think that will certainly get readers buying their newspapers. Uh, um, the Citizen referring it, to it as a toll shock, and the Star saying the toll battle rages on, but perhaps a, a good compromise, could be. I think it's a good compromise. I think that we have a large infrastructure program. It cannot be financed entirely from tax revenue. It has to be financed from user charges as well. It's unfair to ask a teacher in the Eastern Cape or a poor farm worker in Limpopo to pay a higher tax rate for Gauteng's road system. It's just unfair. And so it is right that the Gauteng users of the roads pay for it. Now within that, there's a complete exemption for minibus taxis, a complete exemption for buses, complete exemption for all public transport uh, uh, vehicles. And within that, there is a significant reduction, I think, from 66 cents per kilometer to about 30 cents per kilometer. I think it's a very fair compromise. But the principle of tolling, the principle that people have to pay for the, for the infrastructure upgrade is the correct one. Yes. And Dad, that's also a question from one of our viewers. If, uh, if this is now the decision on the tolls to reduce the, the fee, but also with central government allocating 5.8 billion rand to Sunrail to make this possible, is, this, is there any change from that, or do we just have to accept this as the final word? Um, there's never a final word in all of these things, as we've seen with tax, tax rates and all of these things over time. But I think I fully agree with Kubin that if we look at the principle of user charges, um, certainly you know, in certain parts of the country, the roads aren't as good as if you look at the Gauteng freeways in those areas, and you can't expect those people to pay for it. So w what is very clear is that government is, is willing to stand behind the debts of Sanro. Um, that's important. It's been a very big borrower in the capital market. Uh, it's bonds that's being held by retirees, pension funds, and, and you know, a large spectrum of people in South Africa. And it's important for government to um, give the confidence that to people uh, owning these bonds yes. uh, that you know, these bonds will be serviced in future and the capital will be repaid. Yeah. And I think that's the final word. And of course there won't be any default right. from the Sunroll because of the tolling systems and all of that. Because in the end, we all need to pay for it. It's just how we pay for it yes. uh, that we need to decide on. So unfortunately, those in the Eastern Cape are paying for, for our toll roads in part. In yes. part. And of course, this, Dave, is a parastatal that is working. Efficient spending, uh, no traces yes. of corruption that we know of. Uh, SAA recently asking for a further bailout. Um, we, we saw the minister talking about corruption and, and dealing with inefficient spending. Uh, what are your views, Kuben? He's been speaking about this for many years. Are we, are we making progress? 
Uh, I think that it is quite possible, and the Planning Commission's diagnostic report makes an interesting sense. It says that in the last seven or eight years, there's been a significant increase in corruption. So corruption is at a very, very high level. In the last three or four years, we have done more to fight corruption than in the last 15 or 20. And both statements could be correct and are correct, I think. So yes, corruption is at a very high level. It is a deep concern to, to, to government. But there is significant steps being taken to try and fight corruption. We haven't won the battle. We probably haven't even started fighting the battle. But there are significant reforms ranging from the procurement system, the supply chain system that the minister outlined yesterday, to issues on the investigative and prosecutorial side, to the tax side, um, and, and the financial intelligence center, all these agencies working together to try and fight corruption. Just one last comment on the newspapers. The Sowetan talks about one trillion rand, Dave, uh, assuming that's referring to the, the volume of spending, government spending. A bigger and a bigger, increasingly larger government. Can we trust the government with our funds? Is this the right way to ensure the growth, to ensure the poverty alleviation? Well, uh, one trillion is, is obviously a big number. We've got to see how big is that as a percentage of our total income in South Africa. And that claim, and that claim has increased over the last little while. Um, but that's because our, our incomes have not grown very fast. So I think the, the key to my mind in terms of the sustainability of government finances is going to come when the economy starts to pick up again, whether we then seriously consolidate the way we did between the middle of two, the 1990s and the middle of the 2000s. Um, and, and that's the opportunity. At the moment, it's very difficult for government, given a slow-growing economy, to consolidate government finances. If we look at the overall increases in the one trillion that is projected for the next few years, let's hope that he can stick to that because those aren't big increases relative to the size of the economy. So they're not at least planning on increasing their share of the pie. Um, but I mean, that, these are only plans. We'll have to see how reality turns out in the end of the day. Madeleine, if we look at some of the micro detail, uh, the there's always this talk about government needs to do more to encourage saving. To what extent did Minister uh, Pravin Gordon achieve that in this budget? He's indicated that he wants to introduce some um, medium to short-term saving incentives for, for people to obviously promote household saving. Um, the, what he's indicated that there will be a contribution of at least 30,000 per annum and a maximum of 500,000 for life. Um, the detail as opposed to how the return on that investment will be treated, he indicated will be tax-free. Now, so as a cost of that tax-free return, he says he might phase out the basic interest exemption. So to understand exactly how that's going to pan out, we're not sure yet. It's obviously going to wait for the legislation to see. I think what is important, though, it, for me is just to understand if that basic interest exemption, which does help savings already, is taken away, that it is replaced with a similar or better system. And I think that's the that's yes. important part to be in mind. And of course, this was referred to in the main speech. Uh, let's see uh, how Praveen Gordon uh, it put that out. In respect of retirement fund and savings, reform of the tax treatment of contributions to retirement funds is also envisaged to take effect in 2014. To encourage voluntary savings, which is a key priority for South Africa, consideration is being given to the introduction of tax-exempt short- and medium-term savings products. That's a new set of products. The proposal is that individuals should be permitted to save up to 30,000 rands a year with a lifetime limit of 500,000 rands in registered savings or investment products that would be free of tax of, on interest that is earned, dividends or capital gains. <laughs> we believe that there must be more such products to attract all uh, income groups in South Africa uh, to increase their savings. The current tax-free interest income thresholds will be reviewed and possibly phased out uh, as part of this overall reform. So a bit of give and take there on the part of the Minister. Madeleine, uh, some of the take was on the capital gains tax side, significant hikes for individuals, for corporates, for trusts. And I think you don't want to be in a trust right now. Uh, what are your views on that? And if you could also answer the question from a viewer, without being a tax dodger, and we all need to be honest about our taxes, how can I get around the increase in the capital gains tax? Hmm. That's always a loaded question. But, I mean, there is some good news for the capital gains tax. I mean, your annual rebate did, did move up from 20000 to 30000 so there's some adjustment there, and if you die, you, your annual rebate is sitting now at 300000 
and if you sell your house, your primary resident rebate sitting now at two million. So those are the good news. Now the bad news is obviously the, the hikes of the basically inclusion rate into your normal tax computation. It's gone from 25% to 33.3% for individual, which is it's a big it's a big hike as well as your companies has gone from 50 and trust from 50 to basically 66 percent so those inclusion rates are you're going to feel it for sure and I, but i must say i think the people that's going to feel it the most is obviously your higher income earner because for the smaller person out there that uh, do basic um, sale of an asset you might find the rebate might buffer that quite a bit and even then you still got your normal primary income tax rebates that might buffer it a bit further but unfortunately, there's no way to dodge it. If you've got an asset and you're going to sell it, then, then if the rebates don't help you out, you're going to have to pay. Yes. Kevin, I, I imagine I saw you nodding approvingly there about the capital <laughs> gains tax. Of course, there's yeah. a divvy tax as well. And we've had all the, the debate in the U.S. about the, the tax on the rich and the buffer tax and so on. It seems as though we're moving in that direction. I think that the Financial Times has had this interesting piece of, of articles on the crisis of capitalism. And you know, even very pro-market people feel that there are three or four lessons to, to learn from this financial crisis. One of those lessons is that you must have a fair tax system. That in many parts of the country, including South Africa, the top 1% of income earners and the top 5, 10% of income earners has actually done better off as a result of the tax changes in the last 20, 30 years globally. And, and that needs to be corrected slowly, gradually, without undermining economic growth, without undermining investment, without undermining savings. But the tax system has to be made more fair. Uh, uh, Minister Nye, do you, uh, I beg your pardon? No, <laughs> Minister, <laughs> Minister Gordon uh, referred I'm to get me fired. <laughs> <laughs> or promoted. <laughs> um, his reference there to the capital gains tax. Uh, let's see there, he referred to the introduction there and referring to the specific numbers. There's a change in capital gains tax. When capital gains tax was introduced by Minister Manuel in October 2001, this was an important step in broadening the tax base of South Africa. In order to reduce the scope for tax arbitrage and broaden the tax base further, the CGT inclusion rate for individuals and special trusts will be increased with effect from the 1st of March 2012 from 25% to a modest 33.3% and for companies and other trusts from 50% to an equally modest 66.6%. And then, Dave, the other one which gave me a bit of a double take was the dividend tax. Now, the STC was reduced from 125 to 10%, and we were told we're moving over to withholding tax on dividends, and that will be at 10%, and I believe that was in the legislation. We're now told casually it's at 15%. But as Kubin says, this is moving in the right direction for an equitable tax system. Yes, I... I think that was quite a shock to us as well. I mean, because you, you do your planning in terms of, you know, the 10%, all of a sudden it's 15. Um, but I fully agree, yes, it is with this movement where effectively, if you look at people living off their capital and from the dividends, etc., they've effectively increased the, the tax rate uh, on those people. 15%, um, though, is still a lot better than 40%, if you, if you think of it from that point of view. Um, but it is a shock. And it's, again, one of those things that... If you say one thing you know, 12 months ago and now all of a sudden uh, it's something different, one's just got to watch out that you don't destroy the credibility of the whole budget process. And this is something where we've made enormous strides over the last 10, 15 years in South Africa. And again, we must preserve that because the benefit of that in terms of your cost of funding, uh, how people you know, act in the economy relative to what government's trying to achieve, those things are all very dependent on credibility. Yes. So I think I'm more worried about that in terms of the credibility of the budget. You've got to preserve that. So that's the, the big picture, Madeleine, the detail, uh, this withholding tax. Uh, any more detail on how it will work, how we will pay it, how it will be implemented? Sure, yeah. Those rules are already in the legislation, so they kick off now 1st of April. And all the companies um, that I'm aware of have put in their systems because there's very much paper exercise that goes around it. So certain type of shareholders would be exempt, and there's a whole list of them, including your pension funds and your South African companies. And then the guys that's not, well, and those guys need to be basically provide a declaration to the company before they declare a dividend to tell them we're exempt, don't withhold tax. And as a whole, other people that's going to pay dividends tax is mainly your natural shareholders, your non-residents, whether they're a company, a foreign trust, as a whole, um, or 
or any other kind of legal entity over there. Um, yeah, so those are going to be subject to the dividends tax and they're going to feel it because that's going to be at 15%. Yes. Madeleine, so a question just come through. Who sure. pays this, this dividend tax, the shareholder or the companies? We know it's on the shareholder, but, but it's with, withheld from the company That's level. correct, correct. So the changeover from secondary tax on company to the dividends tax is a, legally it is a change of the, who's liable to pay the tax. So it jumped from a company to the shareholder. But practically, the withholding requirement, the actual withholding of that tax is still going to be with the company or intermediary, which, which you can define as, for example, an insurer or somebody like that. So they're going to physically withhold the tax. So in your pocket, you're going to get after-tax money. A um, little bit less now, after 15%. But, yeah, which is actually in line with international trends if yes. you look at other withholding taxes of other countries. And STC of course is an anomaly internationally so it, it's been a good adjustment for us. Absolutely because foreign investors never understood secondary tax on companies so it's in line with international trend. Let's I look think at there was yes. one other thing I think uh, foreign dividends also taxed at 15% now. Is yeah. that uh, well, And that wasn't previously the case? Foreign dividends I saw came in now at 10%. The, the proposed legislation, the idea was to bring it in foreign dividends. There are obviously going to be a whole bunch of exemptions, but the proposed legislation that's sitting there is, is going to be taxed at 10%. So I'm sure they will probably adjust the two to be in line, because otherwise okay. it wouldn't make sense. But, as but that's stands, a big change, because previously that was added to your income. So you could pay 40% on a that's foreign right. dividend, where it's now it's different, which yes. obviously impacts on the attractiveness of foreign shareholding yes. uh, for a local investor versus local shareholding. Indeed. Mm. Well, Mr. Gordon certainly understands uh, this issue. Let's uh, listen to what the Minister said on the dividend tax adjustment. In respect of dividends tax, the secondary tax on companies, which is the tax that we have currently, will be terminated on the 31st of March 2012 and a withholding tax on dividends will be implemented on the 1st of April 2012. This has been in the pipeline for three years now. This will align South Africa's tax treatment of dividends with that in most other countries. Pension funds will benefit from this transition as they will receive dividends tax free. The dividends tax will be introduced at 15% as opposed to the original 10% we thought. So with all these adjustments, the, the bottom line question for the typical viewer here would be what does it mean for their portfolio, the long-term returns? So we've had adjustments to the dividends tax, uh, your retirement contributions and so forth. Uh, Dave, what, what are your impressions? Well, first of all, if we look at the dividends tax, also uh, those people investing in PREF shares, there's, there's, a, there's a change there. Uh, the PREF share price has apparently already adjusted yesterday immediately. So uh, as usual, you know, don't rush out and do something today. The market will already did that for you yesterday. I think PREF shares uh, as a means of investment is still very attractive, even though we're paying 15% on, on the dividends now instead of the previous 10. Um, so that's the one aspect. The second one, normally, if you look at the budget, you look at the potential impact on interest rates in South Africa, um, I don't think there's, there's any major impact. I, I think it's neutral for interest rates. Uh, Long-term interest rates, it's a, it's a fairly modest borrowing requirement and at the moment government has got the luxury uh, of borrowing quite easily for two reasons. The one is they're getting a lot of money coming in from offshore. If you look at the foreign holdings of our South African government debt, it's now almost as big as what the pension funds are holding in South Africa. So that's been a major source for them. Um, and secondly, there's very little borrowing going on in the private sector. There is very little competition between the public and the private sector for loanable funds. So, you know, on, on balance, I don't think the budget is putting any upward pressure on interest rates. I don't think it's, result, it's going to result in a fall in interest rates because interest rates are already uh, very low by our own standards if you look at the last 30 years. And then lastly, if we look at the JSE, yes, the dividend tax is slightly higher, but if you look through the budget in terms of company profitability, uh, it's, if anything, still pro, uh, you know, the, the corporate world. Uh, and therefore, in, in terms of the outlook for the JSE, I don't think it's, it's changed anything. And, and we still believe the outlook's positive for the JSE. Yes.
Kubin, the minister specifically referred to all the cash on the balance sheets of South African companies. We know the same applies internationally, the big US and European companies. He wants them to spend that cash. And he, I think it's the first time I've noticed it, he said government has a role to play in, in creating this environment for investment. And with that comes the, the certainty that I think you've referred to before. Again, it's this balancing act. We want your taxes. We want to create this new future for South Africans, but we need to create a good setting for businesses. At the moment, there's a bit of a catch-22 situation. Businesses are sitting on a lot of cash, and there are two reasons for that. One is the global uncertainty, um, the, the, the fact that people do not know how fast the global economy is going to grow, what the big, are there more Greeks or Greases lurking, uh, and so and the natural reaction of companies to take a defensive position. However, there's also a, a high degree of suspicion within the South African uh, corporates of South African policy, economic policy. Are they going to nationalize the mines? Are they going to, uh, and, and that's also holding back investment. And I think that the theme of the State of the Nation address and this budget speech is we understand those issues, we understand those concerns, we understand why business is adopting a defensive position. But if we do have a rise in investment, it's good for everybody. Right? If, if you do invest, the economy will grow faster. Um, you know, if, if you don't invest, the economy will not grow faster. Uh, and it's in your interest for the economy to grow faster too. There was also a reference to more creative ways of financing some of these fantastic infrastructure projects uh, being considered, 43 of them, a reference to public-private partnerships. So this is part of this process of bringing business in. Clearly, government does not have the resources to fund all of the capital expenditure it would have to raise resources from the private sector. It can do that in several ways. It could tax, it could borrow, it could um, ask the private sector to build and operate the, the infrastructure for 20 years and then transfer it back, uh, sort of a concession. Uh, and we're exploring all of those options. The Minister of Public Enterprises has been very clear that we want to put all the options on the table, that we seek private sector investment in these projects. Dave, I'm going to give you the last word. Uh, we've spoken about the budget, uh, some criticism, but a lot of positive uh, assessment as well. For the year or three ahead, because we've got a three-year horizon with the budget, uh, how should we be holding the minister accountable? Which are the aspects that we should be watching for as South Africans? I think, first of all, he's got to give credibility to the budget deficits that he's projected. Um, hopefully the economic growth projection that he made, which is one of improving growth over time, will help him out. Uh, so I think that's important. That's the credit rating agencies, the financial markets will be watching that. Um, and secondly, the, the much talked about switch that we're going to see from current spending within government to the infrastructure spending, the capital spending, uh, they should stick to that. I think that will enhance the credibility of the budget as well. And I think that will contribute to overall economic growth in South Africa in that way. Dave, thank you very much. It's Dave Moore, Madeleine Schubert and Kuben Naidu. Good to have you here. You've been watching our special post-budget broadcast. Our thanks to our guests who spent the morning here. We trust you found this helpful and that it's uh, crystallized the big picture as well as the tax implications for you. My name is Erika van der Marwe, wishing you a good day. Citadel Investment Services Limited is an authorized financial services provider.